right, everyone, please be taking your Bibles tonight. I know we print out some of the past uh, verses uh, for you, but we'll be looking at actually uh, tonight verses 1 through, I'm trying to think here, 1 through, uh, let's see, 1 through 13, I believe, yes. 1 through 13, I believe, yeah, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 tonight, divided up into two sections, and we'll look at the first section and then the second section, because the first section, we'd be here in about 10 minutes and gone, so we are going to take it into two sections tonight and cover as we look at chapter 9 tonight, and we move over into chapter 9, and we're looking at verses 1 through 13, divided into two sections. The first section is 1 through 5, and the second section is 6 through 13, so we'll be looking at that as we take a look at it this evening. All right, we're in our series, No Condemnation. And we're in number 29 as we've started in chapter 1 back in January. Now as we move into September 1st today, we're in chapter 9. That's pretty good for the ninth month of the year. Amen. That, that, that worked out really nicely. All right. And uh, welcome to those of you that are watching by way of Rumble Live, coming into the auditorium here of the West Marion Baptist Church here in uh, Marion County, north central, uh, west, northwest of central Florida. We're a little north of Central. Everybody likes to consider Orlando as Central. So we're a little further north of them, but uh, we're out here in horse country. Love to have you come out and be with us if you live anywhere within the area. But in the meantime, get your Bibles open to Romans chapter 9 tonight, Romans chapter 9. And you can click on the link and download the study guide and study along with us. And we have some wonderful, interesting uh, study tonight as we look at Israel and the gospel of righteousness. Israel and the gospel of righteousness and about salvation. And we're going to look at this first five verses. Paul deals with the privileges of Israel, the privileges that Israel had, and yet their tragic failure. And you can see how it totally parallels with us as well of what Israel had is what we have. So we're going to look at that first of all as we look at the privileges of Israel and their tragic failure. So let's uh, begin reading in it. And it says here, I say the truth in Christ. I like that, Paul. All right, right off the bat. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that interesting that Paul tied in lying uh, and truth with the Holy Spirit's conviction? See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It convicts us. And Paul's letting them know that, hey, if I'm lying, the Holy Spirit's convicted me. And see, so he tells us that the witness, the Holy Spirit bears witness uh, in his conscience that he's telling the truth. Okay? That I have great heaviness. Now listen to the Apostle Paul. You've got to understand here, first of all, before we get any further, Paul is a Jew. Paul is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a, a, a zealot Jew. He loved the Jewish people, his heritage, his race, everything about him and he had such a burden for Israel and a concern for Israel in their salvation and so he's talking about that of the privileges that Israel had that God had given to them and then they tragically failed and that's something we don't want to do amen and so let's take so we'll pick it up here in verse number two that I have great heaviness listen to the heart of the apostle apostle here and continual sorrow in my heart now, to show you how much he loved Israel, look at the next verse. For I, for, I, for I could wish that myself were accursed for Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul said, if I could, I am willing to be separated from Christ. Uh, the curse means to be damned and go to hell for the sake of Israel. He was willing if he could. And of course, we know once you're saved, you can't. There was no way Paul could go to hell. But yet, he was willing to do that if it meant the, the, the nation of Israel to be saved. Now, that's a burden for people, you see. A very, very burden, he says. Who are Israelites? He tells us who they are. Now, watch this. Look what God did for them. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, all that was given to Israel. Whose are the fathers, and whom, as concerning the flesh, 
Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So let's uh, dig into this a little bit and see what Paul is talking about. We get a little bit of idea of his burden for Israel. He tells us a little bit about all the glory that God had given to them. And uh, he tells us that they came from the fathers and uh, that Christ came. And uh, it's just amazing, but yet they tragically failed. Father, bless our time in the Word now. May we take this passage that Paul's dealing with his people, the Jewish people, the race, their nationality, their culture, and that as he deals with them and says how tragically they failed and what God had done and given to them. I already pray that we will learn something from it and appreciate more and more what God has done for us. And Lord, what he's given to us, how we are so thankful and so grateful and Father, we ask that you would help us to share it with others. In Jesus' name, may the Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide. Anoint the word in your servant in this hour. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first of all, right off the bat, we see a man's great love for his people, the Jews. And his deep concern for their salvation. He had such a love for his people, for the Jewish race, the people and such a love for them, and such a deep concern that he was willing, if he could, to separate himself from Christ, be accursed and be damned, and go to hell if Israel could be saved. Now, folks, how deep is our burden for the lost? You see, how much love do we have for our people? All right? Not just the Jews, but if we want to look at it as our people, we're Gentiles. How much love do we have for the Gentiles, our people, our neighbors, our friends, our families that we know that need salvation? Do we have that kind of burden that Paul had that he was willing to separate him from Christ if he could, that, there, that his family, his neighbors, his friends, his race, his Jewish people would be saved? Wow, what a burden this man had for his Jewish brethren. And we ought to have a burden for our neighbors, for our friends, our family members that we know that are lost and need Christ and need salvation. We ought to come to a place where we'd be willing to, Lord, whatever the cost, to see them saved. It would be worth it, church, because you're saved, I'm saved, we're going to glory, we're going to heaven. There's nothing we can lose. We're on the winning side. We've already won. Do you know that? No matter what would happen to us or what we'd go through, we've still won. We've still won. Even the tragedies that we might go through, the heartache we might go through, and as severe as those things are, and, and, and everything, we have still won. Because you see, what shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. And that's why in 1 Thessalonians, again, here we go. We can't get away from the rapture, can we? Amen. That the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Never, ever to be separated. Amen. Think about that, of that privilege that we have of that glory that God has given to us. And so we ought to have a burden for the lost, a burden for our families, our, our neighbors, our co-workers, uh, whatever. We should have a, that kind of burden and, and that kind of concern for their salvation. Let's not just be so concerned for meeting their material needs, and that's important. And, and doing things for them, that's important. Those are good things to do, and we ought to. But more than that, we need to be concerned for their salvation and have that kind of burden. And I appreciate Paul's burden here. And I've asked myself there, you know, where he said he said had such a heaviness of, of sorrow in his heart. But the fact that he wished that he could separate himself from Christ, I had to ask myself, can, can, can I get to that point? Can I come to that place or that point? that I would be willing to, to do that, to, to see somebody saved, to, to see a nation saved. You know, Jesus said there was no greater love than this than a man would lay down his life for a friend. And he comes along and asks us sometimes that we may have to lay down our lives. 
And so what a, what a burden, what a love that he had. But in verse 1, we see here, notice he says, I say the truth in Christ, and I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit. The first thing, not only we see this great love for his people and this concern for salvation, but we see this plea of, dis, of a distressed man to be trusted. You've got to understand, the Jews hated Paul. They didn't like him. They didn't like his teaching of the Messiah and salvation and grace and, and, and had left basically the teaching of Judaism and, you know, and all of that. And, and they hated this man. Even though they knew what his past reputation was, now they didn't want to hear his messages. And where did Paul go? Every town and village he went in. The first place he went to was the synagogue. Because the Bible says the gospel is to be preached to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And that's where he would go, and you'd find everywhere he'd go, he was run out of town, he was beaten, he was stoned, left for dead. They wanted to kill him, and eventually they did. They took him to Rome and cut off his head. I'd say he's dead. And yet here was a man that they cut off his head and hated him, and here was a man that was willing to go to hell for them if they'd get saved. Wow, that, that's some kind of love, man. That, that's the love of Christ. It doesn't get better than that. But he has this plea, this, this, this distressed man that, you've got to trust me. Now, just in joking, this morning we had a little fun with one of our ladies. I said, now, you've got to go tell Brother Saul, buenissimo. Well, I can't say that, man. He said, no, no, go, when he's coming in the door, just go up there and tell him, buenissimo. He'll give me a kick out of it. She goes, I don't know if I can trust you. Now, I knew what she was meaning. We were having fun. But she did it. And old Saul, he got a big kick out of that. You know, he, he finally came down here. I said, Miss Kathy's got something to say to you. Well, he turned around, went back, and he's going to go back to Kathy back there. And I said, no, no, this is Kathy right here. So she walks over there, and I said, Kathy, tell him, tell him. He goes, she goes, buenissimo. Oh, he got all big kick out of that. So praise the Lord, amen. But uh, this was a man that was distressed for people. He wanted them to trust him. He said, listen, I tell you the truth in Christ, and the Holy Spirit bears witness of that. Then you see the heart of this distressed man in verse 2. He says, my heart is so heavy uh, with sorrow for his own people. And then in verse 3, we see that this unbelievable willingness of a man to sacrifice his own life for his people. Wow, what a love of God for these people, for the Jewish people, people that hated him. People, and, and, you know, and by the way, he, you know, he's writing this in Rome. So he's getting ready to go to the chopping block. I mean, this is, this is amazing. So, he wanted this, this being separated from Christ. So, this great love he has for the Jew. And we ought to have that kind of love for the, our people. And not only for the Gentiles, but the Jews as well. Amen? We ought to have a love for people. And to want to share the gospel with them. And give them the gospel. And, 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 and take whatever it takes to do. That's why, folks, no matter what you give or how much you give here. You can trust us that it will be spent for God's glory and for God's work to reach people with the gospel Amen. around the world, 24 hours, seven days a week. Our website is over in 195 countries of the 211 countries in this world. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have over 1,300 television programs up on YouTube that runs, to, it's our own channel, YouTube channel. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, around the world. Rumble goes out, can get it. Facebook. And so that's what we're trying to do. Secondly, we see in verses 4 and 5, this man has such a great respect for his people, uh, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, because of their position that they have with God. Now, we're going to look at the position that the Jews had that Paul had a, such a respect for. But folks, you and I have that same position right now. This, this is glorious. Notice the first thing with Israel's privileges of glory. Here in these two verses, we see a list of eight of the privileges of glory that Israel had. And you're going to see we've got every one of them of us today. So let's not... Uh, Let's not have a tragic failure, okay? 
But let's look what these Israelites have. First of all, notice in verse 4, they were Israelites. Paul says in verse 4 that they were Israelites. That, that speaks of their culture, their heritage. Who are Israelites? That's the first thing. In other words, you are the apple of God's eye. You are the chosen ones. God chose Israel. Israel didn't choose God. God chose Israel. By the way, you didn't choose him either. He chose you. Because Jesus said so. You haven't chosen me, but I have chosen you. So aren't that wonderful? That God chose you, and he chose Israel. And Paul says, what a glory, what a privilege that my people, you Israelites, have that God chose you. Verse 4. Not only that, he says, look what else he says. Pertaineth, uh, whom pertaineth the adoption. How many of you have read in Ephesians where we have been adopted? Do you see the parallel here? Paul is, is respecting and, and in glorying in the position that God had given to his people, the Jews, and yet we have that same privilege <coughs> today as believers. We have been adopted into the family. God adopted us. What a privilege here. Let's not blow it. Amen? Let's not blow it. Okay, don't get too hard on the Jewish folks because we can blow it too. Look at the third one in verse 4. They had God's glory upon them. Look at that. The adoption and the glory. Church, if you're saved today, you've got the glory of God upon you. What a privilege that God would share his glory with us. Man, that's fantastic. So, hey, we're, we're right there with them, man. And it wasn't anything you and I did. It wasn't anything you and I could do. God gives that to us. Ah, oh, because why? We're adopted in the family. And it's not because we're a Jew and not because we're a Gentile, but because we are a believer in his son, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll see that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at this. In, ver in verse 4, he said, listen, man, you had received God's covenants and the law. He's still listing here what they had. The, the first four are in verse 4, chapter in verse 4. Okay, they had what? They, had, they, they were Israelites, they were adopted, they had God's glory, and they had received God's covenants and the law. The law was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but the Old Testament. Folks, we've received the whole Bible today. And we've received all the covenants that God has promised. Because everything in Christ we have. Amen. Remember in the New Testament at the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, he said, in this cup, this blood is the New Testament, my new covenant. And he passed that on to us. And not only the, and not the law, but remember the law came by Moses. Moses was the lawgiver, but grace came by Christ. We got grace. Woo. I'll tell you, see the parallel here. In verse 5, they had this true worship. Whose are the fathers? And of whom as concerning the flesh? Christ came who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Amen. So they had true worship. You know what we did this morning? We had true worship. You know what the Bible says? That when we come to worship the Lord, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You see, now all this modern day stuff you see out here on television and so forth. See, if they're not preaching the truth, the word of God, they're not worshiping. Because the only way you can worship God is in spirit and in truth. And the word of God is truth. So we have that. Then in verse 5, they had the promises of God. We have the promises of God today. Now don't get into this replacement theology. Okay? We have everything that Christ has. Everything God has given to Christ is ours. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. Amen? Amen. But God did, and, 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 and we are experiencing and enjoying the promises that God gave in His covenants to Israel. But God is not finished with Israel. God will keep His promise with Israel. They will still get His covenants. The church has not replaced Israel. And that's what some are teaching, that God has taken the covenant promises from Israel and given them to the church. Not at all. God will fulfill every one of those promises to Israel in the millennium. 
because he keeps his word. Verse 5 talks about the fathers. The four, they, they had the ancestors. The fathers that had brought them the faith uh, through, through, through all of this. On, going for them. Well, folks, how would we get saved? By our ancestors. Our parents. Our grandparents. Our great-grandparents. And right on down the line, you see, as they got saved and they passed on that faith to us. And we got saved by our ancestors. So what a beautiful uh, picture we have here. And then notice what else they had. In the flesh, Christ came. They had the Messiah. Now Paul says you had all of that and you failed miserably. What a tragic failure. Amen? Amen? They knew the Old Testament. They knew the Messiah was promised. They knew he was coming. And he came that night in Bethlehem, there in Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. They had the Messiah right in their very presence. And yet they rejected him. And they crucified him. How tragic, how tragic they were given. But you know what? I got the Messiah too. Because when I got saved, I got Jesus. When I got Jesus, I got the Messiah. And you know why I got him? Because they rejected him. John 1, 11. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Verse 12. But as many as received him... To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 12 of John 1. You know who that many is? That's you and I. So the very eight glories that they have, we have all in Christ. All in Christ. So let's not blow it. Amen. So that's the first five verses there. Now let's get into, as he continues and takes it a little deeper. And here we're going to see something fantastic. The true Israel or children of God. Who is the true children of God? Well, we're going to look at it. Let's read verses 6 through 13. All right, now notice he's coming off of verse 5 where he says, Amen. So be it. That's the truth. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. He's saying it's not that the word of God didn't take effect to, these, uh, to our people. For they, are, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now you're getting a little tongue-tied on this one. Neither because they are the seed. He's saying here, you see, you don't become the children of God because you're of the seed of Abraham. You don't become the children of God because you're, uh, because you're an Israelite, a Jew. Hello. Keep reading. Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? He makes that statement. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Notice the promise. Keep that in mind. For this is the word of promise. All right, what's the word of promise? At this time will I come. What? God says that that the promise here will be the time when I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah, also conceived by one, even by our father, Isaac. Y'all getting this? For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election (laughs) might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau 
have I hated. Now, y'all going to get the genealogy here, right? God made a promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed and that the Messiah would come through his seed. The Messiah. So Abraham decided that he would help God out a little bit and be disobedient and went in and had an affair with Hagar and we had Ishmael. That is by works. Ishmael was not the son of faith of the miracle child, which would come by faith, actually by grace through faith. Beautiful picture of salvation here. It's fantastic. Okay? But it would be Isaac, the seed. Well, Isaac married Rebekah. Rebekah had twins, who was Esau and Jacob. Esau came out first. Jacob came out hanging onto his foot. But God said the promise would be to Jacob, whose name was changed, to Israel. And the seed would come from him down through David would come the Messiah, the promise. Amen. Okay, are you with me? All right. So let's take a look at it a little bit to help us out there. He says, they know that God's word, they know that God's word, he said that in verse 1, not as though God's word were taken with none effect. They knew God's word. They knew his promise has not failed. God's promise has not failed. They knew that. Okay, are you with me? Say amen. amen. Secondly, the true children of God are not members of a race or an institution. Look at verse 6, the latter part of verse 6. That not to, the word of God took no effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. See, the true children of God are not members of the race or an institution. You don't get salvation because you're a Jew. You don't get salvation because you're born into a Jewish family. You don't get salvation or get saved because you're an Israelite. Neither, because they are of the seed of Abraham, are they all children? Just because they're of the seed of Abraham, are they all children, true children of God? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, number three there, your study notes, the true children of God are not of any particular parentage or heritage. So it doesn't matter what race you are, and it doesn't matter who mom and daddy are. Even if they're Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. You don't get saved. You don't become a true believer, a true child of God, a true children of God because of mommy and daddy. Or because of your race. Or your culture. If you've gone visiting enough and witnessing enough in this country, a lot of times you'll run into people and say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer because I'm born in America. That doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't make you a true child of God just because you're born and your heritage is in America. Because after all, America is a godly nation. We even say it in our Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God. But that doesn't get you saved and born again because you were born in America. Well, my mom and daddy were preachers. My father was a Baptist preacher. Matter of fact, he was a preacher in a fundamental, independent, Bible-believing, King James only, 1611 Bible. So therefore, I'm saved, and I've got a ticket to heaven. No, you don't. It's not who you were born to. It's not your race, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew. That's what Paul's trying to tell them here, who the true children of God are. It's not that. You've got to believe not in the race, not in to believe in the parents, not to believe in the culture. You've got to believe in the promise. And the promise was the Messiah. Oh, this is good. Look at here. He says, here's the proof. Thirdly, or four, number four. The true children of God are believers of God's promise. What was the promise? A Messiah. Isn't that who we believe today? We don't give an invitation here and call people to come and join the church to be saved or go to heaven. We don't tell them and challenge them to come and get baptized to go to heaven. We don't tell them they've got to become a, a West Marianite to go to heaven. 
No, you've got to come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Mama and daddy got nothing to do with it. I don't care if they're missionaries, or evangelists, preachers, or whatever. I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Does it work? So we see in verses from the latter part of verse 7 through 13, Paul says, here are the true children of God. They are the believers of God's promise. He says, how do I know that? Proof number one. God's word and promise was to Abraham, verse 8. And that is, they which are of the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Who are the children of flesh? Those that were born into a believing family are not automatically children of God. You can be born into all the Christian family you want to, and you're just as lost as you can be. Children born into a believing family do not have an automatic ticket and a ride to glory. They got to get saved the same way you got saved. Proof number two, the second one, number two. Children who believe God's promises become children of God. Look at verses 9 and 10. For this is the word of what? promise. At this time will I come. That's God. God says, I'm going to fulfill my promise that I gave to Abraham that there would, through his seed, would come the the promised Messiah. And Sarah shall have a son. You see, Ishmael, Ishmael represents a salvation by works. Hello? You see, Abraham and Sarah decided they're going to help God out, not believe God and trust God for the promise. So we're going to go ahead and make this thing happen ourselves through their own work, through their own effort. They were going to produce the promised Messiah. You don't get saved by works. It's only those who become the children of God. Look at verse 9 and 10. For this is the word of promise, that at this time will I come, that is, God will come, and fulfill his promise, and Sarah shall have a son. She's 90 years old, Abraham's 100. He's the miracle child. You just don't go around having babies at 190. Okay? And not only this, God says, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, who, who was she conceived by? Isaac. Right? Sarah had Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah, and Rebekah had who? Esau and Jacob. And God said, I hated Esau, but I loved Jacob. Also had received by one, even our father Isaac. So you see, the true children of God are believers of God's promise, not the race or the culture or the people or the parents. I don't know how many kids, people I've run into, well, I've got saved because mom and dad are saved. And so they go to church and all this, and they've done this and this, and they teach classes, and they sing in the choir, and they usher, and they deacon, and everything else. So I guess I'm saved automatically. No, you're not. You will die lost and spend an eternity in the devil's hell if you're hanging on mom and papa's coattail. Or you're dependent on any other church or denomination or a race or a people. I don't care what it is. The only way you're going to become a true child of God is to get saved and born again by the promised Messiah and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. That's why we're going to be preaching there's not all roads lead to heaven. The exclusivity of Christ and Christ alone. And boy, we're getting chopped up for that. You should see what's coming down the pike. I mean, preachers. I'm talking about preachers in the pulpit. I'm talking about even some Baptist preachers that do not believe in the exclusivity of of Jesus Christ, that there were other ways, other avenues. No, there is not. Because we're in the last days, Miss Sharon, and there's a lot of false Christ and false prophets that are teaching false and seducing doctrines of devils and demons. And it's spreading like wildfire. That's why I know we're in the last days. That's why if Jesus doesn't come soon, he even said, I'm not even going to find any faith on the planet when I arrive. Got to be a part of the remnant, man. I'm going to be a part of the remnant. I don't know about you all, but I'm going to be in the remnant. Hallelujah. 
All right, look at proof number two. He says, God's word and promise was to Isaac, which happened to be the seed of Abraham. Not the seed of Ishmael, not the seed of Esau. Amen. The promise would come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down on the line through David, and right on down the line. Amen would come the Messiah. Amen. Number one under proof number two. The promise was given before the children's birth. Look at verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to, oh, I love this, according to election might stand not of works, Abraham and, Ish, and uh, what was her name? Hagar. But of him that is of God that calleth. Oh, this is fantastic. So the promise was given before the children's birth. As before all these children we just talked about, before they were born, God gave the promise. And then secondly, the promise was by God's appointment or plan, not by the goodness of the children. Look at verse 12 and 13. It was said unto her, that is Rebekah, the elder shall serve, that was Esau, shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now you'll have to ask God why when you get to glory. I don't understand and can't explain everything. But I put a footnote down here. And you're going to get to go home early tonight. So thanks for coming, for being here long this morning. We let you out earlier tonight. But I wanted to make you have a little time in God's Word tonight. And we've had a good over 30, 35 minutes of good solid study and exciting. But look at here. Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac married Rebekah who had Jacob and Esau. In all of this, the promise God made to Abraham was by God's election and mercy and grace and choice. God does the choosing, not us. And so there you see that the only way you're a true child of God and a true believer, you got to believe the promise. And what was the promise? The Messiah. you got to believe in Jesus. Not in your race or your culture or mom and dad or anybody else in, in the family or any church or denomination. You've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who do and have accepted him, you are the true children of God. Amen. What a privilege. What a joy. And I'm glad when Jesus said, son, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. So we see this wonderful truth that Paul is dealing with, and he, we, he shows us how that Israel's tragic failure, and what it cost them. Now he begins in 14, where we'll pick it up next week. What shall we say then to all of this? See, I love the way the Scripture puts it. Is there unrighteousness with God? Was God unrighteous in his choice and choosing and all this? God forbid. May it never be. Because he is the God, he, he is God righteous, and that is just, yes, he is. And so we'll look at the rejection of Israel next week in chapter beginning in verse 14. Okay, we're going to look at God's right to show mercy and justice as He wills. Isn't that what He did with Esau and Jacob? God showed His mercy and His, and His righteousness, right, as He willed. Now, you folks, you, there, there's things in the Scripture you're not always going to understand. We don't understand it all. But as the songwriter says, by and by, we'll understand it. Amen. But not till we get to glory. I can't explain everything why God does what He does. He's God, He does what He does, and He does what He wants. And so, we, again, we see that right here. Why would God say, I, I, love Esau, I, Jacob, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau? When they both came from the same mother and the same father, and they were twins. Well, then you've got to get in and begin to study the life of Jacob and the life of Esau. 
And that's a long study. And then you'll see why God does what he does in the beginning because that's what we call the foreknowledge of God. <laughs> and God can see way down the line the picture and sees what we cannot see. He knows what's going to happen and what's so forth. He takes care of it right from the beginning. And we have to trust God and believe God for it. So we'll look at that next week. The righteous, the rejection of Israel. And God's right to show mercy and justice as He wills. And uh, that'll be the only thing we'll look at because that'll take us all the way from verse 14 to verse 33. So we may not even get through all that next week. But it, it, it's really good because we're going to get into the glory of God. Oh my goodness, man. We're going to get into God's free will and God's righteousness and God's choosing and God's glory. Oh, this is, this is good. I'm just glancing through the verses here right quick, picking out a few words and so forth. Man, he even goes back to Pharaoh and Egypt. He goes back to, Mer to Moses. I mean, boy, he's going to cover it all. Amen. Well, that's it for the class today. So uh, class of Theology 101 is over, and we're going to go home, and we'll come back next week, and uh, there'll be a test. So get prepared and study for your test, for your exam, uh, as we uh, meet together again for another study in the wonderful Word of God. And uh, I, I love it. And uh, praise God for it. Amen. Father, thank you for tonight. What a joy it's been to be in the house of God tonight. What a way to finish out the evening of a beautiful day that God has made. Uh, to spend a little time uh, fellowshipping with God's people, singing some wonderful songs tonight, praises to the Lord, and then getting into God's Word and learning some wonderful things uh, how someone truly is saved, how one becomes truly a true child of God is by believing the promise, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, help us to, hope folks to understand that, that family, race, culture, creed will not save them. Only Jesus can save. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Thank you for our time this evening. Lord, bless us as we go home our separate ways. Traveling mercies, if you don't mind, sir, please. And be with us tomorrow as uh, if we, that is, if we awake here. If not, we'll awake in glory. Oh, that'd even be better yet. Amen. And, uh, Father, we just thank you and we love you. Father, thank you you chose us. Amen. And shared all those wonderful things with us because of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.